healing the sick like Jesus did. That's what God's ultimate intention happens to be, that we should be so much like him that we would go about doing good. We have a lot of preachers going about today, and uh, they're just going about. They're not doing very much. They're just going about. They, they fulfill that particular part of the Word of God, but they don't seem to fulfill any other part or any other phase or facet of the Word of God. They just go about. But I want to go about in the image of God, and I want something to be restored to my life, and I want you to go about with something restored to your life. And I want it to be something that looks so much like God and acts so much like God that when the world and the devil sees you coming in their direction, they'll say, look, uh, the devil will say, look at that, would you? Just look at that. There's uh, somebody coming down the road. Why, there's the helmet of salvation, there's the breastplate of righteousness, there's the shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and, and uh, oh, you know, uh, he just goes on and describes all of the armor of God, and the devil says, my, that looks like God. Why, my God, it is God. He's got God's uniform on, and that's what God wants you and me to look like. He wants us to have his whole armor and all of his attributes and his essence. He wants you to share in his sovereignty and his righteousness and justice and love and eternal life and omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence and in his veracity. And he wants you and me to be so much like him that the world will say, I see Jesus in his house. God's ultimate intention will always be and never will be anything else but continuing to fashion and make man look like it. Not just uh, a one-man regime anymore. And I do thank God that we have had our uh, men of God and our handmaids of the Lord that have been used so ardently and so beautifully by the Lord. But, beloved, God's intention has never been for one man to have it all. He never has intended for one man to have it all. Did you hear what I, what I said? And Moses, when well, Moses tells us that, it's as clear as can be. Moses said, would God that you all were prophets. He got tired of everybody trying to put him in the middle and everybody trying to use him as the only prophet of God. And uh, it's been God's intention not just to have one man or one Moses or one Oral Roberts or one um, T.L. Osborne or somebody like that. It's been his intention that all of his believing believers would have a word, a more sure word of prophecy. Our God's people would be able to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. I don't believe it's ever been God's intention at all for us to have superstars. I believe that he's always tried to get his people to do something. But we always had that same crowd that wants their Moses. They want Moses to go before them and talk to God. And, no, oh, we don't want to see him face to face. His voice just scares the devil out of us. We don't want to hear it. We want you to talk to him, and we want you to come back and tell us what he has to say. Because it really is an awesome experience for God to speak to people. There's a circle of people who are so afraid to get close to God. They're afraid that he might require too much of them. They're afraid that he might require a holy life of them. They're afraid that they might have to separate themselves from the world and the flesh and the devil. And so they don't want to get too close. They just want to remain for the rest of their lives in the outer court. And then there's a group of people that like to get close enough to get a blessing or to get a healing or to get, uh, you know, the presence of God uh, in a meeting, and they enjoy the conscious presence of God on Sunday. But then when Monday rolls around, they're out there worshiping the golden calf and doing the same things that they uh, did before, and uh, they're no better off. But then uh, there is a third uh, circle of people who have intimacy with God, just like Moses had uh, an intimate relation with God. And Moses spake with God as a man speaks to a friend. What a communication. What a fellowship. What a communion for uh, a man to be able to call God his friend and for God to call Moses by name.
Does God know your name tonight? Does God know my name tonight? Do we know God in such a way that we can talk to him and say, uh, Heavenly Father, I want to make a deal with you tonight. Now, I know that sounds just a little facetious, but you can reach a place in your fellowship with God to where he will listen to you. One time Moses in his intimacy with God and his walk with him, God uh, said, uh, I want to send you and I want to do this and that for you. And Moses said, well, who shall I say sent me? And all God would say is, I am. Now that's a strange answer, isn't it? Well, he said, now, if I'm going to go, and if I'm going to do all of these things that you say I'm going to do, God, I want to take someone with me. And God said, Moses, I'm going to give you an angel to go with you. And you know what Moses said? Knowing God so intimately and knowing God so beautifully, he said, no, thank you. I thank you for the uh, offer, but no thanks. If you don't go with me, I won't go. Can you imagine talking to an almighty God like that? He said, nothing doing. If you won't go with me, I won't go. Listen, friends, I'd settle for the angel, I believe, tonight in my present state. But I'd like to get into a circle of intimacy with God to where I wouldn't settle for an angel. I would have to say, God, if you don't go with me, I will not go to West Los Angeles. If you don't go with me, I'll not go to Miami, Florida. I won't go anywhere unless you personally accompany me. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we were that daring, if we were that intimate with God, and yet he wants us to have such a relationship and to be uh, in such cooperation with his will? You know, I'm going to say something that may shock some of you people. I can't teach you. Just uh, throw the teaching aside. I'm going to preach right now. If I, just let me tell you something. Listen, friends, uh, this is intriguing. This may shock you, but it's a truth. Do you know there's no difference between you and Moses and Abraham and Elijah and Elisha and all of those miracle-working prophets of God? There's no difference between you and me and them. Do you know what the real uh, thing, uh, what the real key happens to be? You know what the real answer to all of their success uh, hinges upon? It is a fact that each of these men who performed those miracles, they did it simply by knowing the will of God and doing the will of God. If you could ever, ever get those two uh, principles down in your heart and live a holy life and know the will of God and do the will of God, there is no miracle but what God would do for you. Now, if God told me to go out here and just speak, and Mount Wilson would just topple over and uh, mess up all your television sets. Well, if God spoke, all I would have to do is know that was God's will and say, all right, Mount Wilson, uh, uh, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it would be done. But we have a lot of people today who do not know the will of God, and they tackle every devil that crosses the street. We don't presumptuously tackle every devil that comes along. If we knew God's will in every given situation, and we go about it according to God's pattern and according to Bible doctrine and Bible principles, you have no idea the amount of success you could have in so far as uh, casting out devils and healing the sick and bringing deliverance to the people. That's all you need. What are we doing today? We're looking toward Tulsa, Oklahoma. Or we're looking toward uh, uh, somebody in Tennessee or somebody in Florida or somebody in Dallas, Texas, and we send off a $20 bill or a $100 check and we get a red ribbon or a gold ribbon or we get, uh, you know, a white thread or a yellow thread or something. And we feel like uh, 
We are paying somebody to do our holy living and to do all of our praying and to be uh, God's man for the hour for us and do all that it necessitates to get something from God and get our bodies healed and get our loved ones saved and get the drunkard, uh, uh, the, the son who is a drunkard or the son or daughter who is a drug addict uh, delivered simply by sending a little money and filling out a little form and shooting it off to some radio preacher. Now, I don't have anything against radio preachers. I've been a radio preacher ever since uh, I can remember. But I want you to know one thing. We do not look to superstars, radio preachers, television preachers, or anybody else to do our holy living and all of our praying for us. The time has come when God says, look, I don't want my people to be a bunch of dumb sheep following just one man. I am sick of the one-man regime. My ultimate intention is still the same. I want people all together on a wholesale basis to have fellowship with me and communicate with me, and they don't have to have a go-between. Hallelujah. I know that's hard for some of you to believe, and I believe God has his men who teach you and God has men who lead you, and they seem to be superstars in this respect because God still has his pastor-teacher relationship for his people. He still has his apostles that go forth and set a church in order. He still has his prophets who keep telling people what they don't want to hear in the first place. And he keeps on sending them out and using them. But however, God is calling all men to repent and he wants every one of us to show forth his glory to the world. Not just one entity or one person, but all the, the, the mystical body of Christ. Amen and amen. In the book of Exodus, when God delivered the children of Israel from bondage into Egypt and destroyed their enemies, he brought them to uh, the mount where he had chosen to reveal himself to the entire entire body of people, not just to Moses, but to the entire body of people. And God said in Exodus 19, 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. He's looking for a whole kingdom of priests. He's not looking for one priest or one superstar, or one deliverer, or a Moses for this generation. He's looking for a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of deliverers, a kingdom of righteous livers. Hallelujah. And God began to speak to those people there. And he said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. He's after all of us, friends. God had ordained for the whole camp of Israel, for all of them to have the same intimacy, the same relationship, the same one-to-one -one ratio that Moses had. He purposed to have every one of them have the same type of fellowship, but they botched it. Now, those first believers, they came, you know, finally to a place with Moses called Meribah, they came to a place of uh, griping, complaining, and murmuring, and they lost out because they failed to enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Let us uh, therefore fear. Apparently that wasn't written for the modern Pentecostals and Charismatics because fear has been deleted from our vocabulary. I hope I don't make anybody too mad tonight, but we'll just take our chances. I'm going to preach it anyway. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. You see, God has spoken his word, and his word is quick, alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sound of soul and spirit in the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner or judge of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God's ultimate intention is for everybody to know him and know the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But let me tell you something, friends. The law came and was given by Moses and the prophets, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, 
And this grace, praise God, and this truth, praise God, is available for every individual believer, every individual priest. Every individual believer is a priest, and God wants you to see this tonight. We see this is still God's intention in the New Testament in 1 Peter 5, or uh, uh, the second chapter, the fifth verse through the ninth verse, it says, Ye also are lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation. You see New Testament application? The same. It picks up right, right here, just as it says it in the Old Testament in uh, the beginning, in Exodus, and then the Apostle Peter reiterates this in a beautiful way. So you see again, I repeat, God's not concerned with a great superstar coming our way again, even though we thank God for all that's been accomplished in the many and varied ministries. There are still some great ministries around who are doing some wonderful things for God, and I don't think God's going to phase them out. I believe that God wants us to change some of our uh, systems and methods that are commonly employed and see where we've been wrong about a few things and, uh, and stop trying to get our show on the road and get uh, the right teaching to God's people and show them that they are to be built up into a beautiful kingdom priest and into a mystical body, into a bride made in the image of God, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, and a people out of a people, not made with hands, a house not made with hands. Do you know, many of you can reminisce tonight and you say, I came out of the Methodist church, or I came from the Baptist, or the Catholic, or the Episcopalian church, and... Uh, God called you out to make you a people for his name. And there are a people out of a people. Even in the assemblies of God, we have people in there, and yet we have people out of a people for his glory and for his name. And I thank the Lord he's doing this with his people everywhere, no matter what denominational tag they carry. And I rather... Uh, hate denominational tags. It's all right for you to call yourself A.G. or Church of God or Baptist or Methodist. I don't care what you call yourself. Just as long as you're ready when God gets ready to call you just a kingdom of priests and when God calls you his mystical body and his royal priesthood and a holy nation, I want you to be ready to drop those tags if you don't mind. Moses knew that God's ultimate plan was not for him to be the only one who was to get things from God and deliver the people. He knew it. He got so discouraged one day, he said, I would, God, that you were all prophets. We see in Exodus chapter 19 that almost immediately after delivering the children of Israel from Egypt, uh, bringing salvation to them, he brought them to the mount to hear his voice just the same way that he did Moses, see. There's equality with God. He doesn't want to give one more than he'll give another. He doesn't set one on the right and one on the left. There is equality and equity in the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad that you're in the kingdom of God tonight? So he brought them to the mount to hear the voice, his voice, just like Moses was to hear his voice. And God was ready to manifest his glory and show his amber light and show his provision and show all of his glory to these people as he did to Moses when that amber light struck that bush and would not consume it but the glory light of God the amber light of God began to burn and Moses turned aside and saw the glory of God and when he saw it he heard a voice take off your shoes and there Moses 
with head bowed and heart trembling and feet bare, looked at the glory of God and to think that that's what God had in mind for these children. That's what God has in mind for these people. That's what God has in mind for you. He doesn't want to speak to one uh, man audibly and never speak to another. He wants to speak to all of you where you can hear him. He is speaking to you today. God is speaking to you tonight. God will surely visit you tonight. God will fight for you tonight. The glory of God is about to be uh, manifested for anyone who will get man out of the way and let God come through and let the Lord be high and lift it up and the train of the Lord fill the temple and the glory of the Lord fill the place. Hallelujah. That's what he wants. Now, you'd think that all of these people, knowing the life-changing experience and knowing the glory that Moses had experienced, would want to be in on this. But because of their iniquity, they were separated from God. You'd think that they would have been overjoyed to hear the voice of God and know his glory. But not so. For Exodus 20, 19 says, uh, Speak thou with us, Moses, and we'll hear. But uh, not let God speak. I, we don't want to hear him. Oh, we're going to die if we hear that voice. Uh, you know, we're, we're not afraid of God anymore, seemingly. And I think uh, we should be until we get in a place where we have clean hands and a pure heart. We ought to be scared to death of God. We ought to be scared to death of God. And I want you to know that... Uh, uh, God wants his people to be in such a place where they're not afraid of him. But I don't know of any group of people today who have arrived. I'm not going around acting like I've arrived. I don't want to arrive just now because when I've arrived, there's no place to go. I want to press ever forward. I want to be on the go. I want to get on into the glory of, of God and into the Holy of Holies. I've arrived all right, but I'm just in the holy place. I won't arrive until I get in the Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. And so don't think you've arrived just because you have your prayer language. No, don't think you've arrived because you speak in tongues. Don't think you've arrived because you have a little joy and a little dance and a little uh, joy. No, no, no. We still need to go into the Holy of Holies. But oh, it would break my heart if the attitude of the church remains as it is today. We want pastor to do our praying. You know, that's the reason there have been nights here where pastor couldn't hardly uh, last through the service and where I couldn't hardly last through the service. It wasn't for the fact that I stay shut in every day and do not take telephone calls. Uh, I would never be able to stand here and conduct a service like this tonight because there is so many needs out there and nobody wants to pray for themselves and nobody knows how to have a, a really an intimate uh, uh, talk with God. Oh, some of you do. I don't mean to discredit anybody here tonight and I don't mean to make you feel bad because some of you have this same communication that pastor has, that uh, your, your servant has tonight. And I, uh, I want you to know I congratulate you for it, but there are so many, the multitude uh, uh, believers are not pressing in and communicating with God. Moses said in Numbers 11:29, "Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them." He was tired of being uh, out there in the forefront and being. Uh, shot at all the time or being uh, bombarded all the time for every little need of the people. You know, here one time God tested his people and they ran out of water and they got Moses and Aaron and all the elders out there and they were going to stone them to death because uh, they wouldn't receive the word. And Moses told them God was going to visit them, God was going to supply their need, but they didn't want to believe it. So here they wanted Moses to do all the talking, and when he did all the talking, they did all the doubting and didn't want to believe. And it's clear and simple that God wants you, and he wants me 
to share in all that he is and all that he ever will be. And the only way we can do it is to come into the same kind of intimacy that Moses had with God the Father and that Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, had with God the Father. He became just like him by beholding him and becoming everything that he is and all that he ever will be. Do you realize if you can just grasp that beautiful truth tonight that you can be just like your heavenly Father? Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed and, and uh, those that were bound with demons and devils. He delivered them because uh, he knew the Father's will and he went about. You know, we need to know what God's will is and then tenaciously cling to maybe one of the 7,000 promises for time that won't do you any good when you get to heaven. How many of you know, I didn't research this, but someone who knows what they're doing did, there are over 7,000 promises in the Word of God that are designed for time, have nothing to do with eternity, and uh, they're just in phase one. They are in time. They won't do you any good after you die. They won't do you any good in heaven or eternity. They're just good for time. And it is written, 1 Peter uh, uh, 5, 7, casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Did you know that you could have that kind of relationship with Almighty God and his Christ to cast it all on him? You don't have to find a faith healer. You don't have to come to a meeting like this if, uh, uh, you know, for that purpose. It's good to come here for another purpose. I know that you need help. I know there, uh, there's somebody here that will not be here very long, very many more weeks, unless God smites the cancer or the malignancy in your body. You're terminally ill. But you know something? God is going to be gracious and kind to you. I believe it with all of my heart. There was a man who came by revelation the other night. Not, uh, It just didn't happen that way. It happened to be the foreknowledge of God, foreordained of God. It was like a drama originating in heaven. God had shown me earlier that day that a man would come into the meeting and be sitting over here in the left uh, a section of the building and would be a tall man with a mustache and would have a blood disease and would have uh, a heart ailment and I could see him taking a medication called uh, uh, Lenoxin for a heart condition and medication for a blood condition incurable terminally ill waiting to die just a few more days and the glory of God came into this place and revealed the man's condition and revealed his need and uh, God changed his chemistry and as long as he can hold to that same faith that changed his chemistry he can live and glorify God and he's testified already to the fact that he has experienced the glory of God hallelujah no one man can bring that to you I'm just a spy. I'm just a one-man spy. I'm not just a one-man faith healer or a one-man prophet or a one-man apostle. I'm just someone who has been allowed to look into something that angels fear to look into and come back with some information that God will surely visit you, that he knows your name, he knows the number of the hairs of your head, he knows your down sittings, your uprisings, he knows from whence you came, he knows where you're going, and he knows the end from the beginning. Hallelujah! And he wants to visit you tonight. The only thing that can keep you from it is unbelief. And unbelief is the unpardonable sin, my friends. So do not to be filled with unbelief. Uh, let us fear, lest a promise of seeing the glory of God tonight. Uh, any of us should leave it or forget it or fall short of it. For God wants to reveal. 
His glory to every one of you on an individual basis and want you to come to Him and uh, believe. Believe. Unbelief will kill you. Unbelief will send you to hell. Unbelief will keep you out of the kingdom. Unbelief will cause you to die with terminal illness. Unbelief will keep you bound with heart trouble and arthritis and all kinds of diseases. It's unbelief that's keeping us where we are in status quo in the church today. It's unbelief that has caused the complacency. But God says, He that cometh to me individually, individually speaking, you and you and you, all of us have the opportunity. He that cometh to me must believe uh, that God is that I am, that I am, that I am, and that I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek me, not them that diligently seek the anointed uh, person, but I will reward them that diligently seek me. How many of you believe God is in this place tonight? Do you believe he's in this place tonight? Then if you'll diligently seek him, he said he'd reward you. He'd reward you. Not if you seek the gift or a word of knowledge, but if you seek Him personally and individually and want Him as a friend and communicate with Him as a friend communicates to a friend. Oh, listen, I don't know of anything that excites me more than to be able to say, God, I don't want that angel. Thank you that you have sent an angel to stand by me. But I don't want him. I want you here. And I want to look at you. I want to see you. And I want to see your glory. And I want to see you and live. But you say, well, no man can see God and live. But you show me where anybody can see God and die. Hallelujah. You figure that one out, my friends. On the other hand, when you see God, uh, you can't die. Glory to God. Hallelujah. No man can seek God and keep on living in adultery. No man can seek God and keep on boozing it up. No man can seek God and fornicate and live unclean lives. No man can see God and live. But on the other hand, no man can see God and die. Hallelujah. 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 You can live forever and forever and forever. Oh, that I may see him, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. So you see, the Lord has instructed me that I should come along and tell the different segments of his body today that uh, he has placed a desire deep within my heart to walk the lowly trail with you and to be one of you and not stand on a podium and say, look this way, I have your healing, I have your help, I have your deliverance, I have a word of knowledge for you. This is only to get your attention, so you will listen to the main theme that God has ordained me to present to you. The divine presentation is, turn your eyes off man. Look upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and let the things of the world grow dim, and let him be your all in all, let him be the I am that I am. God says tonight, what do you want out of me? What do you want of me? I am, I am whatever you want. Well, Lord, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want happiness. So the Lord says, I am your happiness. I am your reward. I am your re-reward. You say, well, Lord, I want to be free from all the sins of the past. I will be your rear guard. I will forget the sins of your youth. I'll make you as white as the driven snow. I'll make it as though it never happen for I am the God that calleth things which are not as though they were I'm going to make you so free from sin I'm going to make you so free from doubt I'm going to make you so free from grief and I'm going to make you so free from the pain and the condemnation that I want you to come to me and communicate with me on a one-to-one -one basis and you can walk with me and fellowship with me and you'll have joy inner peace inner animation, inner life, inner strength, and the whole world can see me through you 
and you, and you, and you, and you. Amen. I'm pleased to tell you that some people are coming to Jordan tonight. Some people know what Jordan River really means. I want to cross over. I want the promised land, but we don't have enough spies. And you just get a spy or two, go over there and see the Word of God. It's big. I mean, those grapes uh, of the Word of God are so big, just one, one delicious uh, bite uh, would give you divine health for the rest of your life. Uh, oh, the Word of God is over there. The Word of God is there. There's plentiful, plentiful measure of uh, everything that you'll ever need uh, for the rest of the journey. But there are giants in the land. Oh, my, isn't that something? Amen. There are giants in the land. But let me tell you something. If we could get enough Joshua's and Caleb's, if we could get enough. You see, a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. But you get the mystical body of Christ together, and may they forget their Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterians and Catholics and Assembly of God and Church of God and all of that sort of thing and get them together and agree together and have one mouth and one mind. Let me tell you, the giants seem very small indeed. And we can possess the land. Now, you know, that's the only reason that we have these meetings. That's the only reason that I am in demand in certain places, or others are in demand, because they've seen something. But the good news is that you can see it too if you haven't already seen it. Come on! You can be a spy with me tonight. You can be a glorious intelligence uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit for this world. God's going to have some people in these last days who are going to solve the energy crisis and solve energy problems because God's people are the only ones that are going to know anything. Uh, this world's going nuts, friends. I mean, going crazy. Uh, the world's going crazy. They're going mad. Forever learning. Never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But what are we doing? We're getting some divine information. We're getting the secret of the Lord. Who has the secret of the Lord, my friends? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. Hallelujah. No wonder some of the, belie the believers today have nothing of the secret of the Lord because they do not fear Him. They do not fear Him. Now, listen. Do you know that I'm not out sinning tonight because I'm afraid of getting caught? I am not out trying to see how much I can do and get away with it. because I'm afraid if I do that, somebody might find out and I'd be ashamed. You know the reason, Dr. Smith, that I don't have any desire for the world, the flesh, and the devil tonight is because I love God. Because I love God more than I love sin. Do you know why the church is in such a mess tonight? It's because she loves sin more than she loves God. We'll have people walk out of a meeting and slam doors and everything else because they love sin more than they love God. And uh, I would hate to see the state of that person six months from now, but they love sin more than they love God. Joseph is a type of Christ, a most beautiful type of Christ. Joseph was in a situation once where he possibly could have had relations with a very beautiful woman. She was a married woman, but he could have had sexual relations with her and possibly have not been uh, found out. But he did not do what he did by fleeing from that situation and that scene because he was afraid of getting caught. 
He ran because he loved God. And I want you to know that uh, we need uh, to run from sin and shun the wrong and do the right, not because we're scared of being caught, but because we love God. Hallelujah. We love God, and we fear Him in such a way that His secret will be with us. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to see a people out of a people doing what God has called them to do today. God's making up an army, and I know, you know, people don't like to hear about the army because in Joel, uh, uh, you know, they think that army may be of worms, but that's not the army I'm talking about. God has an army, he has a nucleus of people, and he has a people who are ready to press in and go over and possess the land. We're going to have some people like that in these last days. And what do you know? We're going to have some young people in their teens that will be able to say no to sin. Absolutely no. Amen. A young man may ask a young girl to commit the fornication with him, and she'll say no. Absolutely no. Or vice versa, or verse vice, and maybe the other way around, because we have both uh, types going on today. But anyway, we're going to not only learn to say no to sin, but no to death, no to cancer. I've been in hospital after hospital, and I tell you it's impossible for me to even think about enjoying sin for a season. When you see the effects of sin, my brother, it's very easy. It's very easy to want to live for God. When you see the bodies that are absolutely torn to pieces, it's easy for me to want to live for God. The wages of sin is death. And I quit, uh, I quit the devil long before payday. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want it, I tell you. Uh, some of you act like you're still working and you're going to get double pay, but uh, we'd better change our, our work right away. Amen? And I hope I'm not getting uh, too loud because uh, you might not be able to uh, enjoy this. But uh, listen, friends, God is raising up a people out of a people. And he wants to purify them, cleanse them. And, uh, oh, I'm not here to tell you how you dress uh, uh, or how I think you should dress. Or I'm not here to talk about taboos. Uh, really, I'm not. I don't know why sometimes uh, these things come out. But, uh, you know... It's not a matter of just saying, I don't believe in smoking, I don't believe in drinking, I don't believe in dancing, I don't believe in gambling, and I don't believe in, uh, you know, going to nightclubs and all of that. That's not enough. That, that's not enough. That, that's not really spirituality. Uh, I don't believe Christians should do the things that unbelievers do, and these are the things unbelievers do, so for that reason we shouldn't do them, but uh, there's a lot of people who are not doing any of these things, and they're not spiritual. Why, the cemetery over here is just filled with people who don't smoke, don't drink, don't cuss, don't gamble, don't commit adultery, they don't do anything, and they're dead. And there's a lot of Christians who don't believe in smoking, I don't believe in drinking, I don't believe in cussing, I don't believe in chasing women, or this, that, or the other, and they are dead and don't even know the Lord. Has nothing in the way of spirituality. But friends, we do need a holy life. We need a holy life. And I don't believe that anyone, no matter how you feel about asceticism, I don't believe that anyone will want to stay where evil is when you get in this company of believers. God's raising up a feet company, somebody who's willing to sit at his feet and become a partaker of divine information, the mind of Christ, insofar as knowing the will of God, and then going out and doing it. You know, we've had some success with people who have been hopelessly confined to institutions and mental institutions and places like that simply because God has given us the key to that person's um, uh, healing. And uh, 
uh, psychiatry, I don't think is a proven science. I, I really don't believe it is, but uh, they do some good for an unbeliever. If they could find the cause of a person's manic depressive uh, state, uh, if they could find the cause for their depression, they might be able to affect uh, not a cure, but uh, uh, at least the alleviation of guilt and pain and some, uh, some help could be uh, given that person, probably throwing a lot of uh, chemicals on top of it, but uh, and glue them together and mask them up a little and mask their symptoms. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is a proven uh, psychology and there is a proven psychiatry and our heavenly psychiatrist wants to make uh, professionals out of all of his people so that they can discern the cause and effect the cure no matter how terrible people seem to be insofar as manic depression and everything else and God is giving some revelations and showing people and equipping people in these last days not just one here and one there but there happens to be a nucleus of people that God is raising up and he's saying look I want you and you and you and you and you to be my true priest and our responsibility to God is rising tremendously tonight it would be better had you not uh, stayed this long because the responsibility level has been rising every minute in this meeting tonight he's demanding holiness and demanding something of you and me he wants you and I not to look for somebody to go in there once a year and come in and out not for a substitute but he wants you and me to put on those garments those five beautiful garments and he wants you and me to put them on you say well I have them on what about this one Galatians 6 the last garment is the garment of charity divine love how many brothers and sisters have fallen into sin or the bleakest of depression and have failed God and done something awful and you haven't even bothered to restore such an one to the fold if we return to that kind of Pentecostal orthodoxy I'll tell you we'll have a royal priesthood we'll have a holy nation of God's people and that's the last garment I believe that some of us need to put on is that glorious garment of charity and forgiveness charity covered the multitude of sins Heavenly Father in Jesus name take these simple words and just pound them into the hearts and the mind oh God fill the frontal lobes of these people with divine information and fill me by revelation with the same thing and I cannot deal this out and teach this without being taught and I thank you Lord that you're going to help us to see you're building a building of lively stones and we're going to be glistering and and we're going to be of the light of life and we're not going to be looking for the podium so much now as we are toward you our pastor and teacher relationship is going to bring perfection and our apostles are going to set us in order and our prophets and the evangelists are going to act accordingly and act according to Bible pattern and we're going to see restoration in these last days how many of you think that's good news amen, amen. and amen and amen I was surely hoping that that little lady that was uh, suffering from cancer would be back tonight is she back uh, where is she oh you're right here on the front row God almost God bless you where yes all right I, I'm gonna pray for you you're not the one I was going to pray for but I'll pray for you anyway all right sister I don't know you I was thinking about a another lady that was sitting in the back who had had uh, uh, some kind of breast cancer but you also have some cancer uh, in the uh, lungs here 
Now, my sister, when I said a moment ago that uh, I, don't want, I don't want to frighten you because I'm not a doctor, I'm not a diagnostician or anything like that. I'm just someone who God, whom God illumines occasionally, and he tells me something, and uh, sometimes he'll imprint indelibly a name on my life. Every name he's ever revealed to me in all these 40 years of ministry is still there. I don't know why, but I can go back... Uh, you know, 30 years later and see a person that God has revealed to me. Now, I don't know your name for some reason because I'm not, uh, I wasn't prepared to pray for you until the last because your need is so great. But sister, I believe you've heard some divine information tonight. Even though some of this is written out, uh, the Word of God is written. Haven't you heard? It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. I believe that God will change your chemistry just because you've come under the auspices of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is written there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Just as it is written there are three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, the Word and the Son are inseparable. In the beginning was the Son of God. You see, he was there with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. So if the Word was God, and the Word is God, then the very Word that you've heard tonight, it is written, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so God has chosen a simple messenger just to speak the Word of God. And somehow there were moments when you felt a quickening of this word tonight. A quickening. It just seemed like, you know, because the word of God is quick. Now, originally I'm down from the south, and if we, you know, should nick ourselves or cut ourselves, you know, if we cut to the quick, you say, ouch, you know, it really hurts. Uh, or if you don't cut very deep, uh, just break the skin, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, you don't say anything, it doesn't, you don't feel anything. But you felt something tonight. I don't mean the mundane feeling of, uh, you know, goose pimples and all that and the chills. That's part of it. But you felt a deep quickening of the Word of God. Amen. Praise God. Oh, bless your heart. There is because the quickening has come. The Word of God is quick. It's alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You see, there's no surgeon's scalpel in the world that can help those lungs. There happens to be no laser beam or no known treatment that can help you. Yeah, that's okay. Well, that's right, my dear sister. Just let me tell you what the Lord's revealing to me. I don't know you, you see. I've never met you. But there is absolutely no known treatment or cure for your present state and in the stage that you're in now. But God. But God. I want everybody in this audience to point for this woman and say there's hope no matter how dreadful the cancer is, but God, but God, who has spoken to his prophets in times past, will speak to his people in these days by Jesus Christ. And I pray that he'll smite the cancers and every damaged tissue and touch those kidneys and touch every fiber of your body and touch the heart and touch the circulatory system until you have some hope and some evidence that God has surely visited you and healed you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Hallelujah. 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 Now, the little preacher girl that was back there, uh, 
I talked to you about your friend. I think her name is uh, Victoria. Now, is, oh, you're Victoria. Would you please stand? Uh, I don't mean to embarrass you, but by revelation, last night, I was hoping you could be here, but I, I know that uh, the chemotherapy has probably uh, done so much uh, insofar as weakening your body that uh, caused you to be too painful to sit through a service. But last night, God supernaturally revealed to me that it is written, can cure you if you can only believe. Now, I cannot pronounce you healed. I cannot tell you that chemotherapy should be discontinued or anything like that. I never do those things because I believe that God can heal you. Now, there are times when uh, a doctor will be honest enough and tell you that it's not going to cause you to have, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, a regression or what do you call that? Pardon? A remission, yes, thank you. Uh, all right, but anyway, the doctor may tell you that. But I'm going to tell you something straight from the heart of God. If I said without having any way of knowing this in the world, Eleanor, is that one of your given, is that your given name? Eleanor. I mean, that's uh, a name you're known by. Eleanor, I'm going to say something to bring real faith to your heart. I know you've had a, a horrible uh, type of surgery. I know that. But God, just as we say, but God, for our dear sister here, but God, he's no respecter of persons. Age doesn't matter. He can heal her. You're younger. God can heal you. But I'm going to say something that's going to bring some real hope to you. Now, you have helped others, you have prayed, and God has answered your prayer, and it's been almost uh, uh, more than you can bear to think that God has not come through for you, or God has not healed you. But I want to tell you how mindful He is of you. There's someone very near to your heart. I want to establish this fight. I don't know you, and no one has talked to me about you. But there's someone very near to your heart, and when I speak this name, it will be as though the Lord is planting a word of faith, and the word of faith will grow. And it will be just like the word of God. It will come by hearing. Faith will come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's already happening. Let's praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, Victoria, just let me say that thus saith the Lord, just as someone named Paul is very dear to you, God will give you faith, if you'll take hold of it, to be healed. Does that mean anything to you? Praise Him with all your heart. It certainly does. Let's praise the Lord with all of our heart right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Uh, sir, sitting next to Victoria, what is your name? Yes. Your name is Paul. Have I ever met you before? Paul, you mean a lot to this little lady. And don't you think it means a lot to her that God knows you, and he knows how she feels about you, and you want to see her healed, don't you? I love you, and God loves you too. Let's praise him for her healing tonight in Jesus' name. Praise him, folks. He's here to do marvelous works in this place.